Children of the Midnight Sun, Young Native Voices of Alaska, by Tricia Brown. Essential question. What kinds of things might two different cultures have in common? These portraits of two Native American children growing up in Alaska reveal how they each celebrate their cultures ancient traditions in the context of modern life. Selena Thompson Haida, belly down on Heidelberg Dock, Selena Thompson 9 and her cousin Jamie peer into the shadowy water beneath them. The girls identify seaweed, jellyfish and salmon while they wait for Selena's teenage brother Charles to come with his scuff. Selena's family left early on the Haida girl, her grandfather's 56-foot commercial senior, and the girls are anxious to join them at a picnic across the water. Look at those fish, says Selena. I wish I had my brother's rod. She loves to fish for salmon, although she admits that a brother's helps reel them in. Selena has three brothers and two sisters, a cat named Fatso, a pen pal, a tree house, and Chana, or grandfather, who tells her wonderful stories. This late August day is sunny and dry, a rare occasion. Heidelberg, a village of about 400 Haida Indian people, lies in rainforest country on Prince of Wales Islands in southwest Alaska. Each year, the area normally gets about 150 inches of rain and a little snow. Rows of totten poles stand next to Selena's school. Some are new poles, others are very old, collected from other places on the island. Minutes pass slowly. The girls roll onto their backs to stare at the clouds. On Selena's wrists are two broad engraved silver bracelets that tinkle whenever they touch. The eagle clan symbol adorns one. Selena wears a silver ring too. My uncle gave me this ring, Selena says. This bracelet was my dad's mother's, and when she died, he gave it to me. I don't take them off ever. Art and culture. Artistically, the Haidas have much in common with their neighbors, the Klingits and Sishans. Their styles vary so slightly that only a clan member or a fellow artist might notice the differences. All three groups carve totten poles and follow similar customs in clan organization, but each group retains its own identity and tribal lore, and each is known for its artistic specialty. Historically for the Haidas, it was dugout canoes made from the biggest cedar trees in the region, found about 40 miles south on Canada's Queen Charlotte Islands. In Selena's village, there is an abundance of artists. Rosa Albi makes beautiful button blankets. Her brother, Warren, carves Haida style boats and totems. Viola Berg teaches Haida art to the children. Selena's mom, Christine, is among those who teach Haida dance. Our dance custom is a special blanket with our clan on it, says Selena. Jamie and I are eagle. There is eagle, frog, bowhead, and beaver. We don't use the same dance steps for every song, she explains. We practice what we are going to do. Our teachers teach us Haida words like kawada, that means quarter, and Dala means money, and Dus means cat, Hawa means thank you. 
Analyze the text. Author's purpose. What do you think is the author's purpose for writing this selection? What text evidence supports your answer? Selena loves to fish. Aldo should rather have a coho salmon on the end of her line. She'll settle for this rockfish. Next to Selena's school is a grassy lot lined with totem poles. Life in a rainforest means there are always plenty of large trees for carving. The frequent rain and constant dampness speed the natural decay of this valuable piece of history and art. Some were moved from water places on Prince of Wales, others were carved here. Historically, the totems served as storytellers, memorials, or signs of clan ownership. Finally, Selina spots Charles on the horizon and jumps to her feet. Within minutes, he motors in and helps his passengers aboard for a 20-minute ride. At picnic, three generations of adults, Selena's aunts, uncles, grandparents, older cousins, and family friends, sit on driftwood logs, talking, laughing, and feeding on bonfire. Over the flames, they roast hot dogs and marshmallows. Tupperware containers of salads, smoked chin or salmon, and desserts are opened. A few grown-ups keep their eyes on the young ones roping in the chilly ocean. Selena can't be tempted to jump in, but waits instead, skilling when the cold water laps against her ankles. Occasionally, a shivering child runs up to a parent for a rubdown with a towel. A few head into the woods to look for berries. Seated in nearby lawn chairs are Selena's grandparents, Sylvester and Frida Peel, respected tribal elders who are passing on stories, language and dance, teaching the hideaways and daily life and in cultural heritage class for children. Selena poses with her mother, Christine, and grandparents Sylvester and Frida Peel. Because clan membership is passed from mother to child, Frida, Christine, and Selena are all eagles. Haida history. Sylvester was born in Heidelberg, but his parents were not. His mother came from British Columbia, and his father was from Kilcom, a village about 10 or 12 miles away from Heidelberg. Kilcom and another village were abandoned in 1911, when the government forced the residents to move to Heidelberg. It was mostly for school purposes, Sylvester says gently, but this was a better place to live, with a river and lots of salmon. At one time, his ancestors all lived in Canada. Some tribal stories say that about 400 years ago, there was a food shortage, and one group came north to Prince of Wales Island. The Alaska Haidu settled in villages that had been abandoned by Klingits. However, other storytellers say the new arrivals were with the Klingits driving them to the northern part of the island. Today, an invisible boundary splits the island, with Klingit country in the north and the Haidas in the south. But wars? None. Lately, the third largest American island, Prince of Wales Island, lies just across the border from Canada. The Haidas found plentiful food when they arrived deer, berries, fish, eggs, crabs, salmon, alibut, and seaweed. 
And even though Heidelberg's children can walk to the little do drop grocery store for candy, pop, crackers, or other snacks, their families still mostly rely on the ocean to feed them. I like coho eggs and dog salmon eggs, says Selena. We dry them and save them for the winter. I help pick the berries and I help with drying seaweed too. My brothers usually go out on the boat and get seaweed on the beach somewhere. At home, they grind it up in the grinder and lay it out on the roof of the house to dry. Then we sell it in the plastic bags. The picnic is wrapping up. And as mothers and aunties are replacing leads and gathering children, the men fold up chairs and carry supplies to the water's edge. In the middle of the cove, the beautiful Haida girl waits, anchored in the still gray water. Charles shuttles the party from the beach to the senior, a handful at a time, voyaging home To Heidelberg, Selina turns her face toward the bow of the Heidelberg girl. Her long black hair flutters in the wind like a flag. A member of the Eagle clan, Selina models her ceremonial regalia. Josh Hodge thinks it. Josh Hodge doesn't know. Whom he will marry when he grows up. up. But he knows she'll be a raven, so his children will be ravens. That's because Josh is a member of the other Klingit clan, the Eagle clan, just like his mother. You are what your mother is, he explained. An eagle can't marry an eagle, and a raven can't marry a raven. Marrying within your clan would be like marrying a member of your family. At then, Josh may not know the word moiety, but he understands the concept. Throughout Klingit territory, nearly all of Alaska's southeast panhandle, the natives historically were born into two moieties or membership groups, called Eagle and Raven and further divide into subclans with animal symbols such as killer, whale, wolf, or frog. The clan share responsibilities. If one clan organized to build a house, the other clan finished the work. Then the first hosted a potlatch, a ceremonial feast that focused on gift-giving memorials and displays of wealth. If a clan member died, the other clan prepared the dead for cremation or burial. Later, the deceased clan would show their thanks by hosting a potlatch, and so it went back and forth sharing labor and gifts with each clan helping and honoring the other. Josh is rubbed in a two-cat blanket, part of his dance regalia. These customs are among the ancient Klingit traditions, woven into daily life in Clark One, Josh's home village of 140 people in the northern part of the state's panhandle. So, to our practice such as smoking and drying fish, carving totem poles and masks, weaving ravens' tails, robes and chill cat blankets, dancing and singing, storytelling and celebrate and patchlets. Nothing is done for the sake of tourists. It's just everyday living. The residents also drive cars and own fax machines in a village that mixes past and present in a postcard setting. Living within nature. Klokwan is a nice place, says Josh. 
We have the biggest mountains in the USA. We have evergreen and cottonwood trees and glaciers, salmon, fish, and deer too. In the spring, the hooligans are here. They are the teeny fish that you can catch in salmon fish nets. We make hooligan oil out of them. We dip dry fish or dry hooligan in it. It's a snack. Clock One is indeed a beautiful, bountiful place to live. That's probably why Chilcat Kringits have lived in this valley for thousands of years. They were sophisticated artisans who often trade with their Athabascan neighbors. They also held the rights to the trails later used by the gold rush prospectors headed for the at the edge of Josh's backyard, beyond the swing set and the fringe of cottonwoods, beyond the smoke house and the skiff, the Chilcat River rolls by in a broad braided pattern. In the distance, snow-capped mountains towered above a lush green valley teemed with fish and wildlife. The people of Klakuan depend on fish and game as their food staples and drive 21 miles to Heinz for any other groceries to pick up mail, see a move or board the ferry on the inside passage. The villagers share this valley with the largest gathering of bald eagles in North America. Each October and November, up to 4,000 eagles congregate to glut themselves on late-run salmon in the Chilcat River. Eagles fight with eagles for fish, Josh says. Clock One is so small that there are 10 children in Josh's class of 2nd through 4th graders. Josh's village is long and narrow. Laid out parallel to the river along one unpaved street with weathered cabins and newer frame homes sprinkled on each side. Near the middle is the community center, used for patchletts and other special events. Josh and his cousins like to explore, run, play, hide and seek and go bike riding around town. There is plenty of room and little traffic and everybody knows everybody else. Growing up Klingit, even though Josh is still young, he has learned the rules of his society, not from books, but from the ravens and eagles around him. And if he had been born a century ago, he would have practiced another Klingit tradition, the avunculate. At about age six, Klingit boys used to go live with their mother's brother, who taught them as they grew to manhood. It was believed that fathers would be too easy on their sons, but that an uncle was the right combination of softness and strictness. Josh's dad, Jones, is a tribal government leader who is teaching his son with assistance from a special uncle. Today, Klingit children don't leave home for the avunculate, but uncles still help to instruct them, and not just the boys in the family. When Josh's mom, Lani, was growing up, she and her brothers learned from their mother's brother, Albert Padre. And when Josh was born, Lani gave him Uncle Albert's Klinget name, Kankida. He still watches out for us now, even though we are grown, Lani says. And he's been training Josh on the fishing boat on the river. He also had an important role in showing me how to make dried fish along with my grandmother, my mom, and my dad. Analyze the text. Arguments and claims. On page 288, 
The author makes the claim that Kwan is a beautiful, bountiful place. What evidence in the text supports this claim? Josh used a spotting scope to watch for eagles in trees along the river. Contact with non-native settlers, gold miners, missionaries, and educators in the last two centuries has altered the ancient ways of the Klingit people, especially in 1900s. The laws of the traditional dancing, singing, and waving was sorely felt. Josh's grandparents weren't taught to dance and sing. Lenny says, if they use their language, they were punished. And as old waivers died, few young people were trained to follow. Only in the last decade has Lenny's generation learned the songs and dances of their ancestors. But listening to old recordings and experimenting with movements, we had a lot of encouragement from the elders, she says. Josh and his uncle Albert Petty leave the village for a fish site on the Chilcat River. From the adults around him, Josh has learned the meaning of the symbols of totem poles and on his special dance clothing. He's learned how to bead, dance, sing, and prepare salmon for smoking. You cut off the head, tail, and fins, Josh says. You use cotton wood to burn in the smokehouse. There is a screen so that no bugs can get in. It is just like how it sounds. Dried fish would be dry. Smoked fish would taste like smoke. What I like are hearing eggs. They are crunchy. They are better than potato chips. On his way to become a man, Josh is surrounded by a village full of eagles and ravens who will make sure he knows who he is. Kankeda, a Klingit, a son of Klukwan. Analyze the text, compare and contrast. How are Haida and Klingit cultures alike and different? What details in the text support your answer?